Well, g'day and welcome to Spatial. This is episode 14. We're doing a deep dive on today's topic, sensing with spatial AI. Uh, this episode, we're going to look at um, IoT sensors and uh, how that relates to spatial AI. Um, we know we've got things such as, you know, we've got tick boxes against uh, computer vision, smurfs and nerfs and gasps and photogrammetry and insert any acronym here. But there's so many more ways that um, we can make our um, local uh, worlds much more intelligent through spatial sensing. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have some professors in the room. We, are, uh, we have Merrick and Violet and William here with us. Violet, this is absolutely your domain. We'd love for you to sort of give us a bit of a, um, a better summary than mine of uh, today's topic and how it relates to spatial AI. Cheers. Yeah. So I want to start out with a question to you all, and then I'll I'll give you the question, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more before I let you answer, and then I'll ask you the question again. I'm telling you that now so that I can get good answers from you all. So um, the question is, how does an environment become intelligent with spatial sensing? So what I mean by that is how does the environment itself become intelligent? Not the agent, not the individual robot. So we have a bunch of robots now in our home environment. Just think you have a um, security camera or a smart nanny cam. Maybe you have no, like motion sensors and object recognition in that. Um, maybe you have smart door locks. Maybe you have smart lights. Uh, maybe smart heaters and coolers if you have a nest. Uh, maybe you have a Roomba. <laughs> maybe in the future we're going to have humanoid robots. Okay, so they all kind of live in their own world and they have their own reasoning and sensing. So something, you know, Williams thought a lot about this as well is how do we make our environment intelligent? So not these individually acting agents, but how do we get them rather than being individually programmed like right now, I have a sensor or a light, and I say, hey, go on every time, it's this time of day. But you never have any sort of coordinated actions across different devices. So in my classes, we play a lot with if this, then that. We use a little bit of, um, you know, some off-the-shelf open AI stuff. See what we can do to get different things talking to each other to do more coordinated actions. But that's all very still recipe driven it's orchestrated it is not um reasoning in any way it's not like you have some situation where um I, I don't even know if this is a you know this isn't a good design prompt but let's say you have an ai that can control all those things in the home um now an intruder comes into the house and maybe it's not just the camera that starts, but the lights start flickering to like divert them from the Ooh, fact that you're actually in the other room. <laughs> or or that, nice. yeah, that no one's not there. <laughs> you know, it, it's just like, there's more, and I'm sure that's like a terrible use case, but there's more capability of orchestrating programs that are multi-dimensional like that, that, require, that have multiple sensors and actuators from reasoning. Um, okay, so one more like little, story I'm going to sh share and then I'll ask the question one more time. Um, so I was recently talking to someone who worked as a um, data analytics something at Ford Motor Company. And what was really interesting when talking to them was it, what really Im was impressed upon me is in every single one of these cars, there are just so many sensors and actuators just in an individual car and same thing for our phones and it, w it wasn't until that moment that i really realized how much our world is just a fleet of so many sensors 
and agents or, or, or and actuators out in the world, but they are all not aware of one another. They're not orchestrated or coordinated as like a swarm. Um, and same thing in our homes. Um, even when I, you know, if you ever give a presentation in a big room, if you just think about how many phones, individual devices are in that room with sensors and all their capabilities, each one of those is acting individually. It's not coordinated, but maybe there are opportunities to create these kind of coordinated environment kind of behaviors. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. Um, you know, that, that technology right now is kind of lacking, that kind of coordinated. So my question to you is more of a uh, technology prompt or like, you know, having come from a product management background, um, I'm trying to make my billion dollars now and I'm hoping that you'll tell me how to do it. How do you actually build a system that makes an environment intelligent? What is the product architecture? Maybe is there are certain types of technologies that need to exist? Like, uh, do we need a local network? Is it all Wi-Fi? I don't know. Uh, is there a certain type of reasoning that needs to be in place to enable an intelligent environment? Um, so maybe, yeah. I, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts <laughs> about that, but if you have any ideas, um, I'm going to just take some notes and then, um, you Make know, your billion just, dollars. Yeah. just go make my billion. Yeah. Sure. Merrick, I can see your cogs working overtime. A penny for your thoughts. Yes, I'm thinking about something smart to say, but can't think of much. Uh, I think this comes down to like the years ago, there started to be this hype about IoT, IoT and, you know, everything will be connected, everything will be generating data, everything will be broadcasting, but then it sort of went away. And I believe that's because quite often there's simply no need for everything to be interconnected with everything else. As, as long as your device that you bought performs the task that you want from it, that's fine. And it doesn't need to talk to everything else unless, you know, you need this uh, agent that connects things together. And that might be your personal AI of talking to AI, uh, APIs that, you know, individual devices have, if you want that. But I mean, very quickly, you might have not just Roomba, but robotic lawnmowers. And I don't know, you might think of... Uh, a burglar being attacked by in this fictitious scenario by your water sprinklers, right? But most of the time, water sprinklers don't need to be really smart. So would you pay $2,000 more for having them connected to your home computer? Or would Injury you not? Away sprinkler or $10 for a smart on-off sprinkler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spraying like pepper spray or whatever, you know, there's two different modes for no reason. But that, that's maybe the, the reason why these things aren't integrated, because people use appliances or tools or machines for individual reasons. And I don't necessarily need my dishwasher to be connected to my Roomba, you know. I'm a bit more pro, Violet. I think you're definitely ahead of the game with that, Fail. Um, but that's always a problem being out there because you don't exactly get to buy your own tropical island. And case in point, us four here not living on our tropical islands, we haven't yet ticked that box yet. So um, I, uh, I've i always been completely wired, uh, definitely had the fastest internet connection in my whole town since day dot and, you know, love it. Um, I think most of the neighbours know my Wi-Fi password and use ours if they desperately need to. Um, my son bought a, me a... Google Home, which I thought, oh, that's nice. Didn't really use it much. And then I realized, oh my God, I can go crazy now. So I um, had to buy a second router just to handle all the load bandwidth, uh, Wi-Fi, lights, taps, everything. Would you believe my coffee machine requires both a Wi-Fi password and a Bluetooth? <laughs> oh. The Wi-Fi is if I put in an, a new capsule kind that it hasn't seen before, it goes and checks what settings to do the coffee on and the Bluetooth is if there's an immediate problem, it gives me a tingle to my phone and watch. Um, but they are all, I think you're perfectly right, the, the if this then that approach or the Zapier or any of the cloud mini low code integration tools are exactly as the world was, the integration world wasn't exactly, today it's still not amorphous and AI driven, but they're still 
You can test rules, so therefore it makes enterprises very happy when you can sign off on rules. But you soon, you soon get to a point where there aren't enough rules in these things to cater for every type of intruder event coming from the South Lawn and I need to fire the sprinklers at them. But it, that's the logical progression, isn't it? If it knows I'm entering the room... Uh, well, one thing I do do smart, and I'll say it nicely before my wife walks out the door for work, um, I have <clears throat> a geofence specifically specifically set up for her that when she returns within a 10k radius it gives me a tinkle to my watch and i go and put the kettle on to prepare a cup of tea for her so yes i win the internet just for five minutes for doing that but it's easy it's it's painless if i boil the kettle and she doesn't want a cup of tea no peril but if she does walk in the door chances are the kettle's just boiled now those things all combined yeah i would love a local smarter way of doing it than have me to do more if this than that to connect to zapier to connect to google home to connect to apple home kit to connect to it does feel like the integration spaghetti code of 20 something years ago yeah i lived through that i repressed that it's better today but it's still a element of spaghetti it's a different kind of pasta but it's still not it's still code based logic based you can read it out and sign off on it. That's not AI. At some point in time, you realize I could write another million lines of code, or I could just get this thing to learn what I do, and that would be even better. Yeah. William, are you signing up for it? And are you quickly doing a geofence to put the kettle on when Violet comes back from work? Yeah, most likely. I think uh, um, it's, it's curious to me that there are some things that we don't do in the homes that I think are kind of natural extensions of what we do already but aren't quite smart enough i think that the nest thermostat was the big promise and the big bet that google made and um that was a kind of uh sort of like automated home management um direction so you could um you could set up routines and for when you were at the office to save energy and then you know anticipate your return and then um you know start the air conditioner or start the heater um, so that the temperature is comfortable when you come home. It's curious to me that thermostats in modern homes don't actually have thermometers deployed throughout the home. So why not have, a, why not have an actuator that um, you know, controls the vent in someone's room and a, and, a thermo and a thermometer there so that you actually effectively have thermostats for all of your house members? That would seem to be something that would be not not really AI in a sense, but more accommodating. Um, a, a lot of these home systems have a compatibility problem. Like they have the they have the problem where companies like Philips and and uh, TP Link and whatnot want you to buy into their own ecosystem, and the compatibility between them is a blocker to adoption. Um, and then the Google Home and the Amazon Echo are the examples of the sort of integrator. Aggregator, aggregator pattern yeah Ish. yeah um, yeah totally it's still not ai um although there's a famous um uh moma entry here at the in the new york moma where um the anatomy of an ai system is is mapped out which is you know the the amazon Ec which is the amazon echo is the the centerpiece of that work but it's a rather strange work because i wouldn't have I wouldn't have considered the Amazon Echo an, an AI system. It's more like a voice control, um, voice control assistant. Um, but I, I think we're starting to see glimpses of these sort of intelligent environments. It, it's hard to talk about an environment without talking about the agents or occupants of those environments. And really the impact we're talking about is how it might affect either the the agents themselves or whether an environment has an impact on a larger environment um that it that it sits inside so for example that what we're talking about our homes as an environment and then the agent says uh as humans the occupants or maybe your Roomba <laughs> as well um or or your favorite your favorite robot assistant um, Amazon has, I think, an interesting take on an intelligent environment with the Amazon Go stores, where you 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 walk into the store and you swipe your card or you swipe your phone, and then you can pick whatever you want off the shelves, and as you walk out, it charges you. And that's implemented with 
like a hundred cameras on the ceiling that then as you're going through the turnstile, it sort of locks onto you and your identity using computer vision and then follow literally follows you around the store and then maps like what you're reaching for to the sensor that's on the shelf. And so they can confirm that yes, you pulled the the protein bar off of this shelf and the 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 Coca-Cola off of off of that shelf. And so that I think is a good example of how an environment gets more more intelligent in the AI sense, at least in the machine learning sense. Um, and I think there there are other similar examples as well, like the the whole promise of self like self driving cars is that you know where you put enough sensors on a car it can sort of navigate. But the real benefit to save lives comes from the collective intelligence of all the cars coordinating with each other, either on a kind of neighborly basis or with some centralized system that can predict um, things like traffic jams and start routing, routing cars around them. So I think we're starting to see glimpses of that. There's still hopes of that. Um, but um, the, uh, the Amazon Go Store is the one that's really the, the kind of commercial implementation and it is, and and they started licensing that technology as well. So it's not an Amazon Go store you have to go to anymore. Now there are these sort of airport magazine shops that implement that same pattern, but with the Amazon Go framework and technologies. And it's funny, I have a few photos of some of them, and there are like a hundred cameras on the ceiling that are watching you as you're walking through the store. It's it's kind of creepy, but maybe something like that we could become accustomed to because. Our expectations are that it's just going to charge us. It's not actually going to like send our like send our information to you know, like some some other central system. But um, maybe in the future we'll have robots in those stores that recommend items to us as we're walking around. <laughs> you know, it made me think as you were talking about this. Maybe there's a possibility that. So many of the so many of the robots and sensors and actuators we have today are so single purpose, like the Roomba or the, the right, smart please. lock. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so much of that has to do with the limitations of the tech today. Mm -hmm. But if you have a more coordinated system, perhaps you have more general purpose actuators, sensors that can be orchestrated together. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, is this is very future oriented so like deal with my um futurism here um but let's say that you have a cafe in the future uh, maybe the cafe is uh, makes decisions to update dynamically it updates the position maybe it like puts out different types of chairs or changes the music volume because it's tuesday or actually um, it tends to be busy right now, or actually this crowd over here is being too loud, so we're going to like mitigate it this way. Actually, we're going to close an hour early. Um, there was a spill over here. You know, like, is there a... Um, you know, maybe in the future, those types of things are controlled by humanoid agents. Yeah. Or is it some combination of the environment itself? Reconfiguring... Reconfiguring or, or making to... adaptations. Hmm. Because there's something to not having to have single purpose sensors and actuators and duplicate them everywhere in whole products or devices. But because we have these multimodal things that can reason, let's just slap like some sensors over here that can sense light and sound there are some cameras um and because you have that you can get um kind of higher order reasoning that like a person might have i still play the devil's advocate because that's not how we engineer things and one example to that might be the until recently roombas didn't do slam they didn't have any internal map of your of your home and they would just go randomly in a direction turn around if they hit something and that's how they just randomly covered all the floor space in your in your in your house and that was done for cost effectivity and that's what made Roomba so you know popular because you could actually get a robot that did that and, and there was not much in, not much intelligence to what it was actually doing and 
So it, if, if it was over-engineered to talk to everything, you couldn't be able to afford it. And it's definitely possible to make a system like that, but you probably need to have like strong motivation for that. Like if you're building a cafe that responds to moods and you know you can reconfigure it and there's some, some certain level of autonomy, I think that's your design uh, objective, right? And then you engineer everything around it. But you most likely won't be ever able to just hitchhike, to just, just, just hijack whatever sensors are in the area. Because people just don't want you to use their phones to stream audio and video because, you know, if you decided you would do that. So there's all sorts of reasons. And I think that the, the intelligence of the environment is sort of emerging with, you know, more and more individual lament sort of living with us in that environment but if you want something sort of over arching sort of tying everything together you must have a strong reason for that and and then you know um, i don't i don't expect that to be to be a standard because you know not like anytime soon because I, I i imagine not that many people enjoy you know that sort of um well, surveillance that they're inflicting on themselves for you know a little bit of comfort so there's there's lots of different elements to it my my biggest sort of point is devices are and utilities are engineered for for purposes to be as good as and cost efficient as they can the integration is and and i would say that people or these companies sell these specific one-use devices because capitalism and we're going to sell like if you think about the way that our sensor actuator world works right now you're going to buy a nest and you're going to buy a nanny cam and you're going to buy so I mean, yeah my... I, 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 would, I would even find examples of, of things going the other way I recently bought a new Philips toothbrush and I've had plenty, you know, like fifth one in the row. I've been using them for years. But this time around, I couldn't find a version with Bluetooth, which I never, you know, would buy. But they just removed it because nobody needs that. Who needs a Bluetooth in your toothbrush? You know, that sort of thing. So. <laughs> well, you're yeah, looking fantastic, Merrick. So it's working a treat. Thank you. Way, thank you. It's, it's worth every penny. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you're right. But I, I do think that there are cases outside of... Uh, consumer environments where this could be valuable. There are there's some case studies around cities um, using coordinated sensor networks around like water management and electricity management. Um, there are um, there there was some there was some talk around some big um, big financial institutions in New York City that uh, wanted to coordinate energy consumption based off of predictive models around the traffic of their employees. So they knew that um, if uh, rain or a storm was predicted over the next couple of days, that the traders weren't going to come into work, and that they were going to work from home, um, things like that. I think it works... If you've already in like it might work in the first places when there are already environments that are already outfitted with actuators and sensors, and so if your if your tower already has like ID badge scanners and automated locks, then it becomes a lot easier I think because you already have that centralized system in place to do something like um, electricity optimization, and if you're if you can drop your electricity bill by twenty or thirty percent, and it just takes your and you're just using the IT department that you already have. Um, maybe there, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's some low-hanging fruit uh, in some of those cases. But, but again, those are like really isolated, um, really isolated cases. It's not that the the billion or two billion folks that are connected to the internet are going to be like super hyper automating their homes. But maybe a maybe a skyscraper that's 80 stories um, tall and ha you know it accommodates 10,000 people. Uh, during the day maybe that's maybe that's better like the new york times building in new york is another example where there's sort of automated lighting louvers and things that can adapt the quality of space based off of how much uh sunlight is is hitting the block and like they can sort of optimize the 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 usage of artificial lights and balance that with sunlight I don't know how well that's working. Although it's it's one of my favorite buildings in New York. I don't know how I don't know practically how it how it actually works. Um, 
And then there, there, there are also examples of people contributing their data, like in ways, for example. I think that yeah. uh, where you're During like crowdsourcing. Traffic. Yeah. yeah. My, my traffic um, is this, therefore yeah. 10 minutes later, a person gets my knowledge transferred to them in real time. Yeah, brilliant collaboration. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like the, I, I think that there's some emotional um, point there where it's like, if you if you see a if you see a police officer like hiding like <laughs> with a like setting a speed trap that you kind of want to mm -hmm. like at least in the U.S. the attitude is just to kind of you know stick it to authority a bit and so I think people feel some satisfaction with warning others that there's a speed trap coming up. So yes. we've long since talked about in this country we should hire ten people to drive around full time and just flash their lights that would lower the speed. <laughs> around the whole nation instantly um, and I'll let you in on a semi-secret when we're on the motorbikes and we just did a lovely thousand k's 600 miles on the weekend uh, in high heat uh, there is a universal signal for uh, police hiding in bushes up ahead and you tap your helmet with your free hand on the motorbike and if you see wow. a motorbike rider there are signals between motorbike riders because you've got a brief second to wave or g'day or whatever but yes there are signals for <clears throat> slow down now so yeah, that is a thing. Well, that is a it, that's an example of collaborative, uh, slightly self-aware environment. So we've got um, home is probably the one where it is obviously most personal. Office is where it's most practical, but um, you'd have to say post COVID facing a challenge. I would just say the Williams example with with power optimization that already exists in new construction. So I sort of like, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to sound like I'm dismissing that. That's definitely the case. But in this yes. case, the, the savings justify the investment and, you know, the, yeah. the engineering you need totally. to do on top of that. And then you come up with a smart skyscraper, which is passive, you know, in terms of energy use and it's optimizing as much as possible. That's definitely a good use case. And, and we, I, th I think we, we see a lot of these, but it's not every day you see a new skyscraper being built or opened. So it's taking some time. So far, rolling all the way back to your opening question, do you think some of the drivers of smart environments or I guess outside in smarts as opposed to agent out, um, what would be some of the main drivers? Obviously, smart is good, and there's a few percentage of the world who are just going to chase after it. You know, <clears throat> my second round to be damned, 10 more devices is okay. Um, but do you think the drivers might have to be a really cost value mm. or safety, a higher order thing to really be the killer reason to get more wine? You know, the interesting thing for me is like, um, you know, Merrick, your original answer was more... Uh, actually didn't answer my question because you focused on the question that you're asking right now, Andrew, which is um, the value. <laughs> well, why would we do this? Like people aren't going to pay for it. Um, I did ask, how will we accomplish it technically? The reason why I say that is because um, I'm a, less interested in it for this kind of capitalist reason. I, I joked about the billion dollars, but really my interest isn't like, how can we get people to buy this? I'm all about like making this happen, which, you know, I, I should care about that because we live in this capitalist world and that's the only way anything is going to happen. But the reason why the value I see in this, which is not necessarily monetary, is that we live in a world that is so driven by personal computing, by individual um, devices that sell one thing. And I believe strongly in collaboration and I believe in social environments. And I believe that if, if we all drive our own little car, <laughs> we all get stuck, caught in the traffic jam. If we all sit on our laptops in the cafe, Maybe we all do our own little thing, but we stop talking to each other. So I think the more we start to think about coordinated devices, that there's more potential for us um, to have more like socially orchestrated things. Um, but I also think that there's, you know, th then there's also benefits at like a city and social scale to like the ways that might change. Now, I do really need to address Merrick's question, which is like, how, like, how do we actually sell this? Because or else it's never gonna happen. Um, sorry, that didn't answer your question at all. I don't know. 
I hope you all have answers for that because I actually don't. It's a joy to be able to ponder the uncommercial world of joyous theory of what if the world was a happier place and everything was free. So yeah, I know bring on the world of Star Trek with, what is it? What was the thing that got them over the world? Uh, um, their T. L. Grey hot there. The fact that they were able to, I'm um, deep into science fiction now, but replicators, the, the replicator was the thing which made everybody just print gold ingots on day one, which suddenly in their, um, you know, um, world, um, you know, replicators will, crisis, make, replicators world, will make things so much easier. That's it. It just turned the world from being money focused to money is now not the object. It's research science. But I, I do love that. And thank you, Mr. Roddenberry, for bringing that to us. And Violet for carrying on the uh, tradition. It is vital to ask the questions of yes, but ignoring the perils of how it makes it happen. What do we want? And that's brilliant. Yeah. So I think the answer is yes, we want it. Uh, I would be happy to put more cameras, nests, things in my house if it meant that, um, you know, that was happening faster. Uh, we've got a couple of our kids have left home, they're old, but we still have their rooms ready for them when we when they come back. We do a thing called closing their doors, which keeps the heater from having to heat that room as much and keeps the animals out. Well, that's a three second zero cost, perfect solution. Um, but yeah, I would also be definitely the first to sign up for a solution that was, you know, close Jason's room now, thank you, or Jason leaves for weekend and suddenly his room i don't know gets i mean it down. is it is interesting i think you know your some of these earlier points about just how frustrating it is today to coordinate some of these things we're moving more towards a world that's driven by intent so actually i to merrick's credit you did actually answer it a little bit because you you one thing you were recommending is it might be something like an ai um, assistant that coordinates something like this. And we're starting to see these like kind of wearables. So, you know, if my wearable that I have, or my personal AI assistant doesn't even have to be a wearable, starts to know the types of things I like. I don't have to program, hey, turn the lights off at this time, blah, blah, blah. They just kind of know when I come and go and I can give my higher, like they kind of get my higher level intent. And then I think that is maybe, you know, maybe that's what a system could look like. It's like in it, it's much more about permissions on an individual level. And it's like the home system. Yeah. Love it. Look, let's keep the future in our uh, topic list of high um, rotation. This is something we can revisit literally every two or three months because the world, as we're seeing in our fast five weeklies, is changing ever so quickly. Robots coming to a house near you, AI responding, coding for us. Yeah, all the things which we started this podcast for are definitely been ramping up even in the three months we've been doing it. Listen, team, we might leave it there. That's episode 14. We'll call that a wrap. Catch you next week for News of the Week and some more deep dive topics as well as more guest interviews being sprinkled throughout the next coming week. So thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll catch you next time on Spatial. Bye. Bye. like more news and insights about spatial AI or have a story or interesting topic you'd like us to cover, reach out to us. Or better yet, come and join the community at Spatial. All the links are in the show notes.